Good morning, everyone. Hey, listen, we got to do that again because it looks so good to see all of you. Let me try it again. Good morning, everyone. Oh, you just don't know how that fills our soul to hear you. We're so glad you are here. So many of you feel comfortable coming today. We're so grateful for you being here and for those of you who are joining us online this morning. Uh, special welcome back. I'm not sure she's in here just yet. Where's Jamie? Is she in here yet? Just a special welcome back to her. Let's give her a round of applause, even though she's not in here. So glad she's doing better and that she's able to be with us today. Uh, we sure have missed her and love her so much. Let me tell you about something that's coming up, Ash Wednesday. You know the, 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 the service we have where you get the, the ashes, the little cross on your forehead? Um, we're going to do that this year. It's on February the 17th. We're going to do it like we did our talk, listen, move prayer services. So it's going to be at 6 o'clock in the morning. You get to wear ashes all day long on Ash Wednesday, which will be good. So listen, make sure you're here for that or you're watching us online as we start Lent this year on Ash Wednesday, February the 17th. Uh, today is Communion Sunday, so I hope you've got your little communion packs uh, Make sure you know how to open those. Uh, one, the bread's on one end and the juice is on the other, so be careful there. But if you're at home and want to join us, uh, go ahead and grab your communion element so that you can be ready when we serve communion here. Uh, I want to uh, also invite you, if you would please, to fill out your communication card. Let us know how we can be in prayer for you. Speaking of prayer, uh, some of you probably have already heard, but uh, there's one family in our church uh, that needs special prayers right now. And that's the Thigpen family. So I'm asking that all of us would pray for Chris and Melissa, and especially their middle son, Andrew, who is in the hospital in Shands. Uh, and so if you would just uh, sometime today, just pray for that family. Uh, such an awesome family, and we, we want the best for them and certainly for Andrew. So let's be in prayer for them this morning. Uh, speaking of prayer, I'm going to pray for us, and then I'll invite you to stand and wave, greet those around you. Let's pray if we could. Father, first and foremost, uh, we join our hearts together for a dear family that's part of this church, uh, Chris and Melissa and Andrew, um, Costin and Jace, all their family. We pray for them this morning uh, as you are watching over Andrew. We pray that you would use every resource under heaven to heal him and help him to recover completely. So just bless this family and help them. Lord, let them know you're there, but not just with them, but with everybody who's in need this morning that your holy presence would be so real, there'd be no doubt, you, Almighty God, are there. So bless them. We've come today so that we can bless you with worship. So God, would you be lifted up as we gather together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, if you would stand and greet one another and we'll worship together. All right, let's get started in worship this morning. I got to tell you, other than my wife, y'all are the most beautiful thing I've seen this morning. I'm, I'm, well, yeah, brownie points, right? No, <laughs> I'm so glad y'all are here. I'm so glad for worship and to hear voices lifted up to God this morning. Uh, don't get me wrong, we, we power through when, when it's empty, but good grief. The sound of the praise of the saints glorifying God is beautiful. And so just you being here represents that. And we're going to sing about salvation this morning. We're going to sing about our testimony because of what Christ has done. And so it gives us joy and hope and peace because we can sing what he has done for us, what he has done through us, and the testimony that that brings to all of us around this morning. So as we worship, I want you to lift your voices. I want you to seek him out this morning.
Anyway, back to it. I want to sing. I want to praise. I want to lift hands. I want to be comfortable to just worship God this morning. Here we go. Come on. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn. Till I may
at the story that we get to tell because of who Christ is and what he has done for us. And so this, this beautiful song is about salvation. They give us our testimony. They give us the words that we can tell people what he has done in our life and for us. As we're going to talk about a little bit later in the song, that's the whole point of what Christ did is that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Why? Because there is so much darkness in our world right now. And there's no other hope. There's no other answer. There's no other way. I mean, sure, you might be able to put a Band-Aid on something, but eventually that Band-Aid's not going to be enough. It might immediately not be enough. But Christ is always enough. Always, always enough. But it doesn't mean that magically all of your problems go away, but what it means is that you look forward to the time when you are with Christ and all of it is gone, and he sustains you. He sustains you in the process. And so that's, this is just another song that talks about this testimony that we have of what Christ has done and how we celebrate all that we're doing uh, and, and I, all he is doing in our life.
he washed me in his mercy and he cleansed me with his blood now i stand complete i have been set free i found life there in that flood to proclaim it. Why? Why do we proclaim it? We talked about this earlier. There's so much darkness in the world. There's so much darkness in the world. And without proclaiming the good news, no one hears. Jamie talked about this this week in our staff meeting, and she said, the one thing that has stuck out to me the most that I, I I'm paraphrasing you, sorry. Uh, <laughs> fooled myself into thinking that Satan's just playing a game with us. He's just playing a game. 
He just wants to kind of make us not win. Just pull a punch every now and then. He's trying to destroy you. He's trying to destroy mankind. That's his goal. He wants death. He doesn't want you to be uncomfortable. He wants you down and out for the count. And so when, when the power of Christ comes in us and on us and we proclaim that, he can't do it. Not to you. And if you love the people next to you, you shouldn't want that for them either. And so we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. The only way we overcome is by the blood of the Lamb. We've sung this so many times. All these songs. And I want you to know we've we got our hope in something not because it could happen, but because it has and will happen. So listen to this. Then I heard a loud voice saying from heaven, the salvation and power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ have now come. Because the accuser of our brothers and sisters, that is Satan, the accuser of our brother and sister who accuses them before our God day and night has been thrown down. It's done. But only for those of us that have this thought, and it's this, that they conquered him by the word of by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. What is your testimony? And who do you believe in this morning? What is your testimony? You get a choice in that. We've talked about that. What is your testimony? And who is covering you this morning? By what authority do you live? We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. And the word of our testimony, the word of our testimony, come on. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. And the word of our testimony, the word of our testimony. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. The word of our testimony. The word of our testimony. Sing it out there. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. The word of our testimony. church communion Sunday we're going to go ahead and do a little piece of the liturgy y'all can follow along it'll be on the screen it's Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another therefore let us confess our sin before God and one another merciful God we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart we have failed to be an obedient church we have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. 
and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Let's pray. God, we... I got no words this morning, Lord. Because you are that good. And you are that holy. And you are in this place. And Lord, it is the blood of Jesus. It is the word of our testimony that will save us. Lord, we are living in a world that seems to grow darker every day. There seems to be more reasons to lose hope every day for those who do not know Jesus Christ. But for those who do, oh Lord, we are not a people of despair. We are a people of, of not just hope, but great hope. Because Jesus Christ wins. You win, Jesus. And because you win, we win. But Lord, I, I fear that we are living far short of the reality of that. Lord, we are not living into the power of the Holy Spirit. We are not allowing you to change us from the inside out. We are believing the lies of Satan. And we are watching him destroy our brothers and our sisters and even ourselves because a lie is always easier to believe than the truth. God, I pray, I pray that you would help us to be seekers of truth. Always, everywhere, seekers of truth. Lord, I am so thankful for Jimmy. I'm so thankful for the leadership he's brought to this church. I am so thankful for these last sermons that we've been going through where we have looked at the hard things, the things we like to sweep under the rug. And God, you have guided him to guide us that we might not walk in darkness when it comes to these things. But Lord, that we would have the light of Christ in us. Or that we would be set free. God, there's so much more in this world. So much more in this life. Than what we can accomplish on our own. And so much more than what we settle for. And Lord, we find that more in you. Lord, you have offered us salvation. Lord, I think sometimes we forget. We miss. We miss what a gift that is. We have the freedom, the right to choose salvation. And oh, that's not settling, Lord. That's not settling. That's getting everything. Jesus is everything. God, I pray that you would be with us as a church, that we would not be found among those who are content to idly get by. Oh God, I pray that you are fanning a flame in us. That you, you have given us a leader who's going to lead and that you are fanning the flames of the Holy Spirit in this church. And that you will break out revival here because we are a people who are seeking it. Oh God, would you join us together today? Would you join our voices as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught? So long ago, when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
I just want to thank y'all again for being such a faithful church. Y'all give and give and give monetarily. There's a slide back here that'll tell you how you can do it. But you have given to me. Y'all have prayed for me. And because you have prayed, God has healed me. And I have no words to thank y'all for your faithfulness. But thank y'all. Thank y'all for continuing to give. And kids have pretty much figured it out. But follow the masses if you want to go to children's church. In today's culture, it's like faith in God is on trial. There's so many questions that are good questions. And it's a tough case. Each question, each objection to Christianity a challenge. Now I defend the truth of Christ. Let's begin. Listen, I'm so, I'm so glad to have Jamie back. I've missed her prayers. I've missed her presence with us. And I'm just so grateful for, for her leadership among us as well. Great music. So good to see all of you. And uh, it, it just it swells our heart. It really does to have you here and to have you join us online. We're, we're, we're tackling another tough case today. This one uh, probably could stir a little bit of controversy, uh, maybe. But here's the question. Can I lose my salvation? Can I lose my salvation? All right, let, let me get a feel for my audience. How many of you were raised Baptist? Raise your hand. Yeah, a lot of us are raised Baptist in here. I spent a lot of my time dating Debbie, going to Jefferson Street Baptist Church in Dublin, Georgia. You know, if I could go with her to church, it was considered a date, man. I was like, I'd be there. So we were in high school and we'd go. And so I had a lot of training in the Baptist church, but I've been Methodist all my life. And so a little bit of what I'm talking about today is kind of the, the opposite sides sometimes that Methodist and Baptist have on this issue of can I, can I lose my salvation? But I'm going to teach you what I have been taught and what I've come to believe today. And so you may not agree with it. That's okay. We can talk about that later. But this is what I know. There, there is the possibility that we can lose our salvation. Now, why is that important? It's important because just as Jamie prayed, I, I don't know whether you sense it or not right now, but it, it just seems to me that, that we're, we're living in a very fragile world right now. We, we live in a very fragile world. It, it, it seems almost to some extent because of the things that we've experienced in our community in the last uh, week's the things that have happened in the world, it almost seems at times like the world is just hanging on a string, just the thinnest string. And it's like at any moment, the string can break and the world falls apart. And I'll just have to tell you, for some of our families, people that we know in this community, it has. And there's, there's just a sense that it just, it just fell apart. And listen, you, you may not be there. You may not be concerned about that. I, I think you probably are. But let me just suggest to you one thing. Your salvation, the thing that we talk about every single week, is the most important thing. Because no matter how fragile that world is swinging on that tiny thread, your salvation is what gives you the hope that, that if it does fall apart for whatever reason, I've still got hope. Now, here's, here's the beauty of it. This was not in a sermon, so you guys are getting extra stuff. Here, here's, here's the beauty of it. It appears to us that the earth, the world, is hanging on a string. But you know the reality? It's not hanging on a string. We sing that song as a little kid. He's got the whole world in his hands. And he does. He's got it. The whole world in his hands. But, but Satan would have us believe that our little world, maybe not the world, but our little world is hanging by a string. And so it's important that we understand that we are saved, that we have salvation. And if we get it, the question becomes, well, then can I lose it? Can I lose it? And, and that's kind of the whole um, case that we're presenting today. And so I've got some scripture I want to share it with you. It comes from Romans chapter 11. A few verses here. This is a scripture that Paul uh, wrote about the Israelites and the fact that the Israelites were the chosen nation, the children of God, and, and that they were part of the olive tree, the original olive tree that uh, in the imagery he uses here. But, but some of them have been broken off of it. So, so read along with me if you would. But some of these branches from Abraham's tree, that's the original 
uh, children of God's concept, some of the people of Israel have been broken off. And you Gentiles, that's you and me, who were branches from a wild olive tree, we were part of a different tree, have been grafted in. So now you also receive the blessing God has promised Abraham and his children. That's why we have salvation. We're grateful that God did that. Sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. But you must not brag about being grafted in to replace the branches that were broken off. You are just a branch, not the root. That's important. Well, you may say, those branches were broken off to make room for me. Yes, but remember... Those branches were broken off because they didn't believe in Christ. And you are there because you do believe. So don't think highly of yourself, but fear what could happen. For if God did not spare the original branches, he won't spare you either. Notice how God is both kind and severe. He is severe toward those who disobeyed, but kind to you if, here comes the big part, continue to trust in his kindness. But if you stop trusting you also will be cut off. I mean, it's, I, I read passages every now and then as I'm coming along and I read them and I stop and I go, wait a minute, back up. What did he say? Do you ever do that? I mean, you can be cut off. Doesn't that sound like we might could lose our faith? And so here, here's, here's, the, here's, the, um, here's the case. On one side of it, you, you have John Calvin, which has roots in our Baptist uh, background for a lot of us. And John Calvin says what? What, what? What's the saying? Once, help me remember it. What is it? Once? Yeah, once saved, always saved. In other words, if you were truly saved, if you really committed your life to Christ, there's no way you can lose that under any circumstances. And, and I'll tell you, I was there for a long, long time. I used to have the, 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 the most challenging and fun debates with my pastors when I was coming along. Uh, especially as a lawyer, I thought I could outsmart him. And so anyway, th then on the other side, you've got John Wesley and you've got Jacob Arminius. Those, those two kind of go together on this whole idea. And their thought is this, that you know what, if you fall back into sin and you give your life over to sin, you can lose your faith. And so there's evidence on both sides and it's a tough case, but I used to be on this side and after I went to seminary and studied and began to learn more about John Wesley and read the scriptures, I landed over on this side. You may not be on this side. You may be over there. I don't know that it really matters. What really matters, though, is that you're sure of your salvation. I'm going to get to that in just a minute. But there's evidence on both sides. Now, let me clarify one point for us. Here's the clarifying point. You don't earn your salvation. John Wesley never suggested that. He never suggested that living in Christ, in this life in Christ, is some way to earn your salvation. Salvation, both would agree, is a gift of God. It is by the grace of God that we receive our salvation. But here's why the question of whether we can lose it or not is important. Because if we believe that we cannot lose it, if we believe that we can lose it, it's going to shape our worldview. That is, how we look at the world. Because if we can lose it, then we ought to be careful not to lose it, which shapes the way we live. It's important. It's an important question. So when somebody says something to you, well, let's talk about whether you can lose your faith or not. One of the questions you might start with is to ask them, why are you asking the question? Why are you asking the question? Because often there's some concern maybe that they might have lost their faith or could lose their faith or that somebody that they know has lost it or might have lost it. And so it's a good question to ask because that shapes the way you want to respond to it. But so here I am, I'm in court. This is the case. My first witness that I would call would be our friend John Wesley because John Wesley had a lot to say about this. He wrote a lot about it. He was convinced that you can lose it. But here's the beauty of it. It's not lost by simply committing a sin. So, so if you get mad with your spouse and you say some words you're ashamed of later on and you committed sin in what you said, listen, you don't lose your salvation there. It takes more than that. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But here's what John Wesley said. He talked about those who are saved, and he called them saints, S-A-I-N-T-S. And I want you to hear what he said. Look what he says. He, he raises the question this way, way back. This isn't a new question. He says this, can any of these saints fall away? 
By falling away, we mean not barely falling into sin. That this, it is granted they may. We're still going to be sinners after we're saved. We do. Sin remains, he would say, and does not reign if you are saved. But look what else he says. But can they fall totally? Can any of these so-called so fall from God as to perish everlasting? That's losing your salvation, folks. He's asking the question. Now, before I get to his answer, I want you to understand what he's talking about with saints. This isn't a question of whether this is somebody who thought they were saved. He's talking about people who were saved. Here's, here's some of the descriptors he uses for that. He says, by saints, these are who I mean. Those who are holy or righteous in the judgment of God himself. That's a saved person. Who have the kind of faith that purifies the heart and produces a good conscience. That's somebody who's saved. Are grafted in. Here comes our scripture today. Are grafted in to the good olive tree, the spiritual visible church, he calls it, are branches of the true vine of whom Christ says, I am the vine, you're the branches. And the last one is, they live by faith in the Son of God and are sanctified by the blood of the covenant. No question who John Wesley is talking about. So you want to see his conclusion. Here it comes. He says this, therefore, I like this little quote, it says, to the law and to the testimony. I not think crazy we just sang about the testimony. Listen, when he's talking about law, he's talking about the Bible. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago or last week. I can't remember what it was. One of the last two weeks. He, he, we're talking about the law, the Bible, what's the authority. And then he's talking about testimony. He's talking about what's been our life experience. What have we noticed about people who were saved, who fell away? What happened to them? And then look what he says. On this, here comes that word, authority. On this authority, I believe a saint may fall away. That one who is holy or righteous in the judgment of God himself may nevertheless so fall from God as to perish everlasting. And he, and he cites for us, is his authority, he cites from the Old Testament, uh, the book of Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel speaking. Look what he says. However, if righteous people turn from their righteous behavior, somebody who's saved who turns away from that kind of living and start doing sinful things and act like other sinners, should they be allowed to live? He's talking about given life here now spiritually alive? And the answer is no, of course not. Are their righteous acts, all their righteous acts will be forgotten. That's scary, isn't it? And they will die for their sins. Spiritually, we die for our sins and end up not in heaven. And so there's his authority. There's plenty of other. John Wesley, he gives us a lot of authority for why he concluded, um, made this conclusion my next witness that I would call would be Jesus Christ himself. Do you know he spoke to this? He did. In a number of places. He, he spoke some tough words. And basically what he says is, listen, if you're not continuing to abide in me, live in me, if you're not continuing to produce fruit by living in me, then you can't be my disciple and you can't be saved. In fact, he talks about it in very, very vivid terms. Look at this. It's in John chapter 15. He's talking about the, the vine and the branches. This is a familiar piece to a lot of us. He says this, yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me. You could underline the word remain in me if you had that in front of you. And I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me, look at this, at this is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. I, I don't know if we have the next, the next uh, sentence in there from the scripture. It says this, such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. There's another one of those passages you're reading along. You're like, wait, 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 wait. What, what did he say? It's not the only place. He says in Matthew 24, uh, verses 12 and 13, he says, at this time when things are turning dark, as Jamie talked about, as I talked about today, look what it says. It says, sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, the one who stays with the faith, the one who continues to abide in him, they will endure to the end. They will be saved. They will be saved. And then he says in John chapter 16, Debbie and I read this uh, yesterday morning as we were working on our Bible study. John 16, 1 says this, all of this, he's in the upper room talking to the disciples. He's about to go away and he's been teaching them some of the most important things they needed to know. And he says, all of this that I've been teaching you, all of it, I have told you so that you will not fall away and turn back. Now, my third witness, I'd call Paul. 
Paul's, Paul's pretty solid on this. In fact, Paul says, he, he, he talks about the necessity of remaining faithful in one of the most difficult passages in the Bible. It's in Hebrews chapter 6. And, and what he suggests there is that if you've been all in for Christ and all of a sudden you turn all against Christ and away from Christ, it's impossible for you to come back to the faith. That scares me probably more than anything. And, and so here's what it says. Look what it says in Hebrews 6. It says, for it's impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened. He's talking about who've come to understand the truth about Jesus Christ. Those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit. The only way you share in the Holy Spirit is by committing your life to Christ. Who have tasted the goodness of the word of God, Jesus, the power of the age to come, and who turn, verse 6, and who turn away from God, it's impossible to bring such people back to repentance. By rejecting the Son of God, they themselves are nailing Him to the cross once again and holding Him up to public shame. There's no doubt in verses 4 and 5, He's talking about people who are saved. People who are saved and fall away. And, and so, you know, what does it take to lose one's salvation? What does it take? It has to be more than simply committing a sin. Because if it's just that, listen, everybody in here is in trouble. Because we all sin, Right? And so I don't want you to walk out of here thinking today, oh, no, I said a cuss word or I did something bad. I've lost my salvation. That's not the message at all. You know, the answer can be found in verse 6. Look what he said. And who turn away from God. Who turn away from God. It's a complete disowning of Christ. It's a deliberate and decisive abandonment of your faith. Because, because, we're supposed to stay with Christ. We're supposed to remain in Him. We're supposed to grow closer to Him. That's our purpose in existing as a church, to help people take their next step closer to Christ. That's what we want to do. We want to get you as close to Christ as we can be so you can be sure of your salvation. It's, it's like we, to turn away from Him, we are completely denouncing Him. One of my Associate pastors, when I was having this argument, he says, Jimmy, it takes more than just sin. What you have to do is you have to have a heart that becomes hard against God. In fact, he would call it a, a darkened heart or a black heart. It, it turns so much against God that you denounce even having a relationship with him. But, but here, here, I want you to hear this too, because Paul says it's impossible to bring them back to the faith. And I struggled with that because I don't believe anything is impossible with God. And so I dug and I dug and I tried to figure out, what, what is he talking about? I read a bunch of commentaries and studied and studied. And here's the conclusion that I come to there. I think what Paul is making clear is that it's impossible for you and me, human beings, to convince someone now to come back to the faith. It's beyond our capacity. You know why? Because they have heard everything that needed to be said to draw them to Christ in the first place. And so there's really nothing that we can say that's going to bring them back. But don't miss this. I don't think it's impossible for God to bring them back into the fold. Now, I, I don't know about you, but, but I, I have family that's like that. I have family that's like that that would fit in this category. And it's one of the most troubling things that I have in my life. I, I think about it all the time. I pray about it all the time. I do. And maybe you know somebody like that, or maybe you've got somebody in your family that you're concerned about for that. Listen, don't give up on them. God's not going to give up on them. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Keep praying. Keep pushing. Keep encouraging. Keep loving. And let God do the work. Let him do it. You know, uh, Paul, Paul described two men like this in the Bible. How would you like to have your name in the Bible for somebody who had been in the faith and who turned away from it? And you'll, you can read about it in 1 Timothy chapter 1. It's in verse 19 and 20. He's encouraging young Timothy, who is a, a, a strong believer. He's going to be a, a leader in the church. He's encouraging him with this letter. And he says, listen, you need to cling to your faith. Cling to it, to your faith in Christ. And keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately violated their conscience. And as a result, they, their faith has been shipwrecked. And when a ship is wrecked, you usually can't get it back to floating most of the time. But, but look at verse 20. Here are the two folks. Uh, Hame, Ham, I'm going to say Hamanaeus. How about that? Sounds good. And Alexander are two examples. Those are two men. Look what it says. I threw them out and handed them over to Satan so that they might learn not to blaspheme God. 
threw him out of the church because of that. And if, if you can't lose your salvation, why would Paul say, hey, Timothy, make sure you cling to your faith and keep your conscience clear. So there's such a strong case that you can fall from grace and lose your salvation. But I need to, I need to tell you this. I need to tell you that there, here's the warning for me. I think for the people that you know that that's happened to, sometimes it's a sudden event. Something happened in their life, and all of a sudden they give up on God. Maybe it was somebody that was hurt in a tragic accident or something, and, and you, you wanted God to heal or help or something, and nothing happened, and, and you got mad with God and you walked away from him. I mean, that could be somebody in your life. The, but, but here's the way it most often happens. It's a gradual process. It's a gradual process. And this is where, as Jamie was talking and Brooks was talking, this is where Satan is at his best. Because when we, when we commit our lives to Christ, we make a turn. We, we've been, let me do it this let me illustrate it this way. Before Christ, we've got the world here and we're pursuing the world. You guys don't represent the world. I'm just speaking uh, metaphorically here. So, so we pursue the world. We're moving towards the world, right? And the world, here's, here's what the world's doing. It's calling to us. It's like the world is over here through Satan saying, come over here. Come, come with me. Follow me over here. We make a turn sometime in our life and we, we turn away from that because we've learned about, we've been enlightened and we've learned about the love of Christ and, and we sense that we want it. And so we make this turn in the opposite direction and we start working towards Christ and we walk towards him and, and we want to be closer to him and, and we're following him. Our focus is on him. It's on Christ. But here's what happens sometimes. We're, we're rocking along and, and, and before we know it, all of a sudden, we, we start hearing things from our old world, the world we used to follow. And we, there, there's this cry and this call. And so we, we, we don't mean to. It's not like we're intending to. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves very slowly turning and turning and turning. And before we know it, we have turned so far. Didn't mean to. I mean, I still know Christ. I still know where he is. At some point, we've turned so far that it locks in, that there's a click in the way we turned back. And we're locked in to the world. And when that click happens, that's when we lose our salvation. Now, can you get it back? Can I get it back if I've, if I've done that? Can I, can I be saved again? The answer is yes, you can. We just talked about that. It is possible. In fact, John Wesley believed that. And he spoke to that in one of his famous sermons called, uh, it, it's called uh, A Call to Backsliders. And so listen to what he says uh, in, in this uh, sermon. He's talking about individuals that he knew that just went through that process I just described to you. And he says, several of these, after being thoroughly sensible of their fall, their fall back and locking into the world, he says, they were aware of it. They were deeply ashamed before God and have again been filled with his love and only perfected therein. Not only perfected therein, but established, that's a word in the old English, strengthened and settled. Look what it says. They have received the blessing they had before with abundant increase. It's like if you've been here and you've turned back here and that click is released and you're able to start turning back towards Christ, you come back stronger. And that's my prayer for the people that I know that have done that. He says, nay, it is remarkable that many who have fallen either from justifying or from sanctifying grace and so deeply fallen that they could hardly be ranked among the servants of God have been restored. They at, have at once recovered both a consciousness of His favor, God's favor, and the experience of the pure love of God. Of God. They came back stronger. Isn't that good? Because, you know, the love of God never stops. It doesn't. He's always for us. He's always calling us to Him. And so in today's passage, uh, in the Romans passage, if you read a little bit further down, it says this in verse 23. It says, and if the people of Israel turn from their unbelief, they will be grafted in again. For God has the power to graft them back into the tree. Isn't it good? So, so the question is, hey, what about me? Do, am I saved? H have, I, have I fallen into Satan's trap and turned back? Because all of us have moments of weakness or temporary lapses in our faith, and we stumble at times. We do. 
But, but those who remain unrepentant have persisted in their rebellion against God. And, and they've lost their faith. They've lost their salvation. Paul says this. He says this. Well, listen, here's what you need to do. You need to examine yourself. It's in 2 Corinthians. He says, make sure you're examining yourself. Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know, surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, if he's not with you, you have failed the test of genuine faith. So how can I be sure? Three things quickly. Here they are. Here's the first one. I need to be sure of my salvation. Here's the first one. I got to be sure that I have committed my life to him. Not just say I believe in him. Not just in my head say I think Jesus is real. I think he, I think he probably did live. I think he's a good person. No, no, no. It's committing your life to him. It, it is making that turn to him to where you're locked in. Are you with me? Where it clicks and you lock in. And you say, I'm giving my life to you. I am surrendering my life. Because it's a, you remember we talking about volitional ascent? It, it's a matter of free will and choosing it. I've got to choose it. I've got to choose it. And so here's the second thing i got to do. Once I get there, once I do click it in and I lock in, here's what i got to do. i got to remain there. i got to remain in Christ. Which means this. i got to continue to allow the Holy Spirit to work on me, to grow me, to love others, and to love God even more. I've got to offer up my thoughts and my words and my deeds as a holy sacrifice to him. I've got to give it to him. My thoughts, my, my words, my deeds. And I've got to guard against that slow drift because Satan is pulling you and me as hard as he can back around to face the world and be drawn there. It's kind of like the slow drift is like this. If you've ever been sleeping and you're driving a car, and you drift over into the other lane. You catch yourself. You wake up. And you jerk back over. Sometimes I do that for fun just when Debbie's asleep, just to <laughs> get her attention. No, I, don't, I don't really do that. It's like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in the wrong lane. i got to get back. There it is. I mean, I, I love something that, that Jamie said this past week as we were discussing this message. She said, she said, when we choose Jesus over the world, we're not getting the lesser of two things. When, we get, when you get Jesus, he's the cream of the crop. It's not like we're settling like she talked about in her prayer. We, we, we're not settling for you know, the lesser of two things. We're getting the better thing. So why wouldn't we want to remain in him? And here's the third one. i got to bear fruit. If, if you play back, if you were to take a videotape of your life over the last, you, you pick the time frame. And you watch that videotape. Here's the question. If you want to bear fruit, the question is, am I seeing fruit? On that video, am I seeing myself living out, producing fruit? Because if I see more of the world in my video playback than I see of Jesus, then I'm probably in trouble. If I'm not drifting, I might already be there. And that's a challenge. Because James tells us, the brother Jesus said, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save you? save you or anyone because genuine faith shows up in genuine living it does it shows up in a changed life bearing fruit so here's a comforting thought for you if you're a little bit worried about whether you've lost your faith or whether you are losing it chances are you're not losing it so breathe okay just breathe because if you are there you're probably not at a point where you've lost it. But there may be a warning there to watch out that I don't fall into the slow drift. So can you lose your faith? Okay, I know some of my dear friends in other faiths will say, no, 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 you can't. And we can have that argument. But I fall on the side of John Wesley and the Methodist and what I've just studied, and I think we can. And so i got to guard against that. Here's some next steps for you maybe to help you there. First one is this. I will not be afraid to ask questions. Listen, questions are great. We've had so much fun in our uh, content team meetings kicking these questions around. In fact, Kathy Wright said, we should invite the whole church to come. and Let's just sit around and talk over these questions. It's so much fun. It's trying to think through these things. Second, I'll examine my relationship with Jesus. And third, I will get connected with other Christians so I can continue to produce fruit and grow in my faith. One of the best ways to do that is to be discipled one-on-one. -on -one. And if you'd like to do that, let us know. We'll make the connection for you. So today, we uh, conclude the service with communion, which I think is absolutely appropriate.
because I talked about Jesus being in the upper room. And when he was in the upper room, he was telling his followers, the disciples and others, that he was going to die to lay down his life for them. And one of the ways he illustrated that was by taking some bread and breaking it and giving it to his disciples and saying to them, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And they were probably scratching their heads saying, I don't, I don't understand. What's he talking about? Bread, broken body. And then he held up a cup of wine. And he gave thanks to God and he said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ that we might be the body of Christ redeemed by the blood of the Lamb for the whole world. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So now if you'll take your communion elements and go ahead and receive those, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ given for you. I know we're up against time um, for our service, and so I guess I'm going to say this by saying, if you've got to go, <laughs> you're not going to be judged. But I feel like after this, um, just um, four minutes of a song to testify, to glorify, to remind us again of what we've gone through today. Uh, so if you'll stand and sing with us as we close our service this morning with this song.
Oh, wow. That's, that's it. That's what His mercy did for us. And so, listen, when I tell you every week to, to keep the faith, that's what I'm talking about. Today was right on it. And here's the other part. Uh, do what we need to do to be saved. But when I say God's got the whole world in His hands, that's the last part. When I say He's got this, He does. Listen, He's got it. We love you guys. So glad you're here. <laughs> we hope to see you next week. Go in peace. <laughs>